not Pastor Steve. I am Leah. Um, but I'm going to do our welcome. So if you're joining us online, welcome. Please put your name in the chat. We would love to know who is with us. As Pastor Steve always says, we don't want an anonymous body. We would like to know who you are. And if at any point throughout the service you need prayer, click the prayer request button and you'll be taken into a private chat room to speak with our host. So to begin our service, we'll open with our call to worship. It comes from Psalm 86, verses 1 through 5. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am your servant who trusts in you. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an For you, O oh Lord, are good and forgiving. And abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Gracious God, I come today hoping to be served, yet wanting to be of service. Knowing a few things, yet wanting to learn a lot more. Asking forgiveness, yet needing to forgive. Hesitant and unsure. Yet told you meet me here with love. I lay down my plans for this hour and pray that in this place I will learn to trust you and serve you in every place. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I'd like to welcome Alexa and Joe for worship. guys, it's good to be back. Um, I hope you guys are, have been staying warm throughout the blizzard craziness. Um, but anyways, we, my name is Alexa, this is Joe, and we're from the Well Collective, and it's so great to be with you today. Um, I invite you all to stand and join me as we sing praises to the Lord, um, and just know that you are who he said, he, never mind, you'll get it, okay. <laughs> um, the first song is I am uh, who you say I am.
worship be more Try. 
The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was here broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name Turn to your neighbor and welcome each other. <laughs> One, two, three. I'd like to invite uh, Rich Endo and Marie Brown to come on up. All right, come on up, uh, Rich and Marie. We had a couple of uh, church officers that we still want to uh, install and pray over today. Rich, Rich was uh, actually going to see the Northern Lights in, uh, in uh, uh, Greenland, right? Or Iceland. Iceland. You were in Iceland. Marie Brown wasn't, was not feeling well that day, I think, that we were doing the, the, the service of installation. And so this is a, pr a privilege for us right now to do that and to come together as God's people. And so I want to just say a few words before we do that this morning. Though we have different gifts, together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make God's church useful in the world, and we call all people to faith so that in the end every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And within our common ministry, some members are chosen for particular work as ministers of the word, elders or deacons. And in ordination, we recognize these special ministers, remembering that our Lord Jesus said, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You're going to hear that again later today. I want to ask you the questions of ordination and installation today. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? 
acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Rich and Marie. Do you? We do. I do. And do you accept the scriptures to be of uh, the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? I do. Amen. And do you accept the scriptures of the Old? Whoops. No, I just read that one. And do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you and do you? I do. And will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? All right. And will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you, be, uh, will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? I will. And will you, in your life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbor, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? And do you promise to further the peace, the unity, and the purity of the church? Do you? I do. And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love by the grace of God? Rich, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline serving and governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ, will you? And Marie, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ, will you? Amen. Now, our clerk of session, Shirley Sin, has these questions for you as members of the congregation. Will you please stand? Church, accept this elder and deacon chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? We do. Thank you. Can we have a few elders and deacons? who uh, will be serving with Rich and Marie come forward right now for the laying on of hands. Just come right around, around them. Gracious God, we thank you for your faithfulness to the church, that as we call for leaders to arise and to serve together, that you always provide exactly what we need. You give us the gifts, you give us the strength, you give us the perseverance and the power and the humility to serve together as your people. Lord, we thank you that you've called Rich and Marie to this task we thank you for the unique and special qualities, their past history, their love for you, their love for the church, both the challenges and the trials of daily life, and also the power and the grace that you provide in each of them personally in their own personal stories. We thank you, Lord, that all of who they are, all that they have, all that they offer to you has been now laid at your feet once again in service. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them and fill them with your Holy Spirit, encourage them and allow them to, to do the things that, that you've called them to do in this season of ministry. Thank you for their leadership. Thank you for their love. 
Thank you for their faithfulness. But most of all, thank you for your love, your leadership, your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Rich and Marie, you are now elder, an elder and a deacon in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You too, Marie. And God's people, let's pray this prayer together. God of grace, who called us to ministry as ambassadors of Christ, trusting us with the message of reconciliation, Give us courage and discipline to follow where your servants rightly lead us, that together we may declare your wonderful deeds and show your love to the world through Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. And all God's people said, amen. Abraham, lead us in prayer. Uh, we get it in the book of uh, John chapter 15, 5 says, if you are truly in me, I am in you. So, Father God, we are really in you and we believe in you. So we know you are with us now in spirit. As we give ourselves, our life, here to you another Sunday. Father God, forgive us. We are all broken. Each and everyone here has a problem. You are the sole provider of solutions to problems. Help us, Lord, your servants. This family of St. John, we are here before you again on our knees, praying for you to forgive us and give us the strength to replenish us to go ahead with the new week we are beginning today that we overcome the difficulties we have. Father God, we're calling upon you to pour your healing mercies on those of our brothers and sisters who are not able to make it here with us today. Heal them. Heal them, bless the medication, bless the prayers, bless the effort everyone is making to make them get well, Father God, so they can join us to worship you. Father God, there's a lot of disasters, earthquakes, wars, man-made, um, individual created difficulties for your people. You are the only solution, Father God, we are praying that you give the strength to those that are grieving, those that have lost members of their families in the earthquakes, in natural deaths, in wars, and all that. Bless them, Lord, to get the strength to grieve for them and know that one day life will end and we will be with you as it is our hope and our journey to be working hard like Christians to join you one day. Father God, we are praying that you give the leaders that are leading especially America, other parts of the world, to get good governance to rule over their people, in order that they rule with you in heart, Lord, and say, but what am I doing to these people? Is it what God has provided me to handle? Let all the leadership in the world, Lord, rule and think of you as the only God creator who made them to be where they are. Father God, we are praying that we have just ordained new officers to our church. Give them the talent, the love to share here with our family here in St. John. Bless our pastor. Bless each and every leader in this church and every member of this church to share the love that Jesus said before coming back to heaven that we should love each other as we love ourselves in order to avoid problems and differences. So, now, I would ask that you join me as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors, and let us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you, Lord, for drawing us again together to this time of worship and prayer and sing in song and just hearing again the message of your grace and power in and through each of us and our desire to serve and to live our lives for you and to love one another. We just thank you again for this precious gift we call the church, and we pray that you would speak to us once again, each one who is here through your living word. Give us some fresh bread and fill us again with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. In the series that I've been preaching on the Upside Down Kingdom, we've been learning about how Jesus completely reversed all the categories that, uh, that were accepted in the ancient world and, and today as well. It's a kingdom, the kingdom of God, where neediness is blessed, where enemies are loved, where big things come from small, where we find our life by losing our life, where we find that outsiders are insiders. And today, we're gonna to be learning about how rulers rule by serving. When I was uh, just newly ordained as a pastor and I was serving at Granada Hills Presbyterian Church, I'll never forget, the pastor that I served with at that time was Stan Jones. And uh, I remember the first session meeting as I walked into the room where those meetings always took place and there was this huge table and uh, it had, it was an old fashioned boardroom table. 
It was wider on one end. It was, it's a long rectangle, not quite as long as the one that Putin sits on, but it was, it was long. A very long table, and it was sort of rectangular in shape. And the way it worked is that the, the, the leader of the meeting would sit on the, uh, the, the, the wider end, I think it was. No, it was the narrower end, and, uh, and everybody would sit. You can see that kind of a V-shaped table. Well, the reason why it was shaped like that is so that everybody could see the leader, right? Well, I remember Stan saying to me as soon as I walked in the room, he said, I hate this table. I hate this table. He said it was donated to the church by a CEO from his office, and it's designed so that everybody can see the person who's leading the meeting, but the problem is you can't see each other. You can't see each other. And what I learned from him is that leadership is about making sure that everyone can see each other and serve together. And that was an important lesson that I learned from him. Because Jesus, I think, had that perspective. He wanted to make sure that the triangle or the, or the pyramid of leadership was going to be turned upside down or rearranged in a way that had never been really spoken of before. And I want us to look at Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45, where Jesus has this very important conversation with his disciples. Now James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. We want to sit at the end of the table with you. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to appoint, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's think about these words, and let's think about what we can learn at the end of this series on the Upside Down Kingdom about power, about leadership, about serving. In the Upside Down Kingdom, the ruler rules by serving. Whoever wishes to be first among you Jesus says, must be slave of all. Now, I think one of the things that's important for us to remember is that this event happened as Jesus was on his 120-mile walk from Galilee to Jerusalem as he was preparing to face the cross and the suffering of the cross. And Mark records earlier in that chapter that as Jesus was walking ahead of them, they were amazed And those who followed were afraid. And that's because Jesus predicted that he was going to be handed over and that he was going to be condemned to death. That's the immediate context of James and John's request in verse 35. They make it clear that they want to be booked reserved seats, you might say, at Jesus' right and left hand when all this stuff comes down. And in some ways, It was a kind of a vote of confidence that things were going to go better, much better than Jesus was predicting. They were still holding on to this idea of the messianic power coming down on Rome and rearranging the whole political structure and reestablishing Israel's place, preeminence, and creating a new kingdom on earth in which Israel is at the top of the pyramid. But it also shows that Jesus' words, his words about 
the suffering servant, his words about uh, humbly serving had still not been heard by his disciples. Which is why Jesus has to ask them a clarifying question. He asks James and John, he says, are you able to drink the cup that I am going to drink? And that cup, of course, is the cup of his suffering. And are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am going to be baptized with? That word baptism, of course, means to be, to be submersed, to be immersed. Are you, are you able to be immersed in that experience that I am about to be submersed into, the experience of, of rejection, of pain, of suffering? And of course, the answer to that question, if they knew what was about to happen to Jesus, was absolutely not. They were not prepared for that. They were going to run as fast as they could when Jesus was betrayed and when he was taken off by the temple guards and crucified on a Roman cross. They would be nowhere to be found. So Jesus defines a new a new way of looking at his leadership, and at the very same moment, he makes it clear that that suffering leadership, that humility, is something that Jesus' disciples are not yet ready to embrace. And so he says, whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. It's a new kind of submission. You're not ready to go to the cross. But let's talk about what it means to be submerged into service. Let's talk about what it means to be submerged into humble service with one another. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. That was pretty shocking language, considering what was going on in the empire at that time. In the time of Jesus, Caesar Augustus was the most powerful human being on earth. And there was only one Caesar Augustus. But there were 60 million slaves. 60 million slaves. And in the first century, no one could imagine society without slavery. It was like electricity. Slavery was everywhere. There were indentured servants. that were slaves who were uh, those who had been captured in battle. And so slaves and indentured servants were literally a part of the fabric of society. And you can see how subversive Jesus' words were. Like the emperor who came to be served, Jesus completely rejects that idea of being served alone himself, but says, I came not to be served, but to serve. Like a slave. And I'm calling you to take the lowest rung on the ladder. In the upside down kingdom, the highest rung is the lowest rung on the ladder. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, he says in John's gospel, you also ought to wash one another's feet. It's easy to smile and say, you know, everyone is equal, all right? Besides, it says so in the Declaration of Independence. Everyone's equal. But the reality is that society has layers, and it's always had layers. We rank each other by, how do we rank each other? In school. Maybe it's by how tough we are on the basketball court, or by the grades that we get. Who can throw the other kid into the trash can? I was really afraid of getting thrown in the trash can in middle school. And I, I learned the pecking order very quickly, the ninth graders and the seventh graders at that time. And as you get older, there are other kinds of pecking orders. You find out that uh, it's those who have the, you know, you're ranked by your paycheck or you're ranked by the, the school that you go to, the job that you have, the neighborhoods that you live in. And one sociologist noted that we should really choose our mothers very carefully. <laughs> it makes a difference if we're born into a wealthy family, doesn't it? Or whether we're born 
into a poor family, whether we're among the majority or whether we're among the minority, or whether we're birthed by a million-dollar mother or by a homeless mother who's addicted to heroin. It makes a big difference. On the night Jesus was to be betrayed, Jesus broke through all those social distinctions in a, in a dramatic way when he washed his disciples' feet, and then he said in verse 13, the Gospel of John, John 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. In a typical Judean home, there were always great water pots at the door of the house, and typically if there was a servant there, the servant would wash the feet of those who came in. But in Jesus' band of followers, there, were probably, there probably was no servant around, <laughs> and they were probably taking turns washing each other's feet. That particular night, uh, remember that conversation with James and John, of all the, the animosity probably that was brewing between them as they were talking about who was the best, or who was the greatest, or who deserved to serve, sit at the end of the table with Jesus. Nobody was really willing to wash each other's feet. And at that point, Jesus gets down on his knees with a basin and a towel, and he begins to wash their feet. It's a teachable moment. And so Jesus shows them his, his beautiful upside-down kingdom once again. He reverses the hierarchy, and he begins to serve. But it, it would be a mistake to, to think that Jesus is just exchanging one type of hierarchy for another, that instead of the powerful being on top, it's now the powerless who are on top, and the powerful are on the bottom uh, licking their boots. In Jesus' upside-down kingdom, he takes down the ladder altogether. The ladder is on the ground. He flattens the hierarchy, and he reminds us that each of us is made in God's image. And Jesus says, wash one another's feet. As we read in, in Paul's letters, Paul says, do not use your freedom in Christ as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love... He says, become slaves of one another. And just, you have to remember again, this is a world in which slavery is everywhere, and the, the enslaved are being used as the model of greatness. Already the gospel is beginning to subvert the whole idea of being enslaved. Or the slave, as Paul says in his letter to Onesimus, is your brother. There's neither slave nor pre free, Paul says, for we are one in the body of Christ. I love uh, Martin Luther King's words. He was preaching on this text, and he had these words to say. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that the one who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. And the thing that I like about it, by giving that definition of greatness, is that everybody can be great. Everybody can be great. Because everybody, Martin Luther King said, can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You only need a heart full of grace a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. These are beautiful words and true words. In the upside-down kingdom, the greatest among us is the servant. And I want to say one more thing about this text because of Jesus' example to us. In the upside-down kingdom, the helpers are honored with our help. The servants are honored as we serve with them. Jesus repeatedly, over and over again, looked around in the room, and he recognized and he honored the servant. 
I'm thinking of how Jesus honored the woman who washed uh, his feet, anointed his feet with oil. Another event that happened shortly before Jesus' death. He honored her and said, everyone will remember this act of service. Everyone will honor her. And I'm thinking about how Jesus honored the woman, or honored the, uh, the servants in the parable of the prodigal son. And it's the father who calls the servants to put a new robe on his son who has returned and new shoes on his feet and a new ring on his finger. It's the servants who enact the, the grace and the love of the father. The servants are recognized and honored. In the catacombs of Rome, one of the most ornate Christian tombs is dedicated to a person named Ampliatus, which means beloved of the Lord. And because there's only a single name on that tomb, we know that Ampliatus was a slave. But he was a slave who was honored, who was revered in leadership in the church. And so his, his tomb is more beautiful than any other in that area of the catacombs. He was a servant leader in every sense. Jesus was breaking down those barriers within the church between the slave and the free. And one way for us to bear witness to Jesus is to honor the acts of service that we see around us in our community and then join them. And I think one of the ways that we can truly bear witness to the, the values and the character of Jesus is to keep our eye out for the servants. And I'm not just talking about in the church. I'm talking about in our community. I have to say, I have a, a neighbor who I've grown to really appreciate. Her name's Penny. And uh, she's been walking another neighbor in our, in our community who's gotten a very, very, very serious cancer diagnosis. And I see her at least once or twice a day. I saw her this morning as I was driving to church, uh, walking our neighbor around the block. Just accompanying her. And um, we've had a lot of conversations together. And she knows that I'm a pastor. And I just, I went up to her and I said, wow, you are such a good neighbor, such a loving neighbor. And I just wanted to encourage her. And I think one of the things that we can do is we can look for the signs of Jesus in the people around us, maybe who aren't even considering themselves followers of Christ, and we can honor the work of God in that person and bless them and then come alongside them and join them in that work. And maybe even in that conversation, in that relationship, we begin to be able to reveal the love of Jesus that we've experienced. I want to say that even in our church, we can ask ourselves, who are the servants? Let's look around us. Who is serving the children? Who is teaching our students? Who is cooking? Who is cleaning? Who is teaching and praying and singing and ushering and live streaming and soundboarding and serving as a deacon or an elder? And maybe you could all say, well, yeah, <laughs> you know. In a church like ours, there's, there's not many people who are not involved in some form of service. But I think every single one of us need encouragement as we do that, to persevere and to love and to jump in and to come alongside. Because every time we rule by serving, every time we look beyond titles, every time we ignore backgrounds or conditions, Every time we care for the least of these, every time we help those who are helping and serve with those who are serving, we subvert the status quo. We take down the ladder and we make a decision to live to the glory of our upside down God. Let's think about that in this moment of silent prayer.
Let's pray this prayer of response together. Gracious God, we come to you as your children, confident of your goodness and mercy. Just as Jesus humbled himself to come among us as a child, and then as the Lamb of God, may the sacrifice of his life and his service among us teach us to live as servants to all. Send me to where you need me to represent Jesus. Let me bring your good news to those who don't realize you want to be their friend and Lord. Use my resources, my time, my talents, and my heart for the sake of your kingdom. Fill me with your power, clear away any obstacles, and help me to serve you and love my neighbor in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the Lord that we follow. Wow. Let's stand and sing Jesus Calls Us, number 399. Friends, if you're an in-person worshiper, I just want to remind you that you can come forward to be prayed for this morning by an elder and a deacon. I believe today we have Julia and Abraham are praying at the pulpit. And online, you can stick around under the virtual Morton Bay fig tree and also be prayed for by your prayer host or just stick around to chat. And also want to remind us again to pray for the folks, uh, the dear uh, brothers and sisters in, in Turkey and in Syria, and that we can give to Presbyterian Disaster Assistance as we do. I think we've got some slides up today. Do we have those slides? All right. And also, I want to uh, invite you next Sunday and spread the word. First Sunday of the month, we're having a, a soup and a salad potluck, which means you guys get to bring the food. So we're, we're looking forward to that. You can, I believe, sign up on a table outside. Is that true, Ellery? Yeah, and Melissa says we can sign up afterwards. Let's bring the food. Let's enjoy that time together next Sunday. And as you're doing that, a couple of things are going to be happening. Uh, we're, we will have um, a, a Discovering St. John's membership class. I think that's a later slide, sorry. But uh, that'll be following. But uh, let me go ahead and stick with the slides. Uh, next, next, next week, I'm starting a new sermon series that'll be taking us through Easter, and that's a series on lessons from great women in the Bible, some of them whom you may have not heard of or forgotten. 
So I think you're going to really enjoy that as we study together and learn from the great ladies, the great women of the scriptures. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. You can sign up on the small group table to be a part of that. Also, Alpha, it continues on Thursday nights from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, George, myself, Tony, we'll be there to lead that with you. We hope you can join us. Uh, I'd love for uh, a few folks to, to, to join Leah, and uh, I think we have uh, one other person that signed up for that new members class so far, the Discovering St. John's class, and I would love to see others. Um, so please, be a part of that March 5th and 12th. And remember, a couple of other things, a preschool family activity is next Sunday with, with um, Nancy Ashley, and there's a deacon blood drive on March the 19th. I've been asked to remind you of that as well. So there's a lot happening as we come down the pike at St. John's. We hope that you'll be a part of it. Thank you again. I thank you and bless you as you serve the Lord together, as we serve the Lord together, as we uh, seek to make sure everybody is seen uh, and everybody is able to use their gifts together in the body of Christ in his upside-down kingdom. Now let's hear the benediction. Now may the living, risen servant Christ go with you. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you in obedient ministry, above you to watch over you, within you to give you power, and before you to show the way. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.